Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for a few minutes today. Uh, Safety Chain is very proud to be partnered with SQF in sponsoring today's event uh, for this Lunch and Learn, which proved to be quite, uh, quite interesting and informative. Uh, briefly about Safety Chain, a little uh, introduction. Uh, Safety Chain is a technology company. Uh, we do help automate and streamline and improve many of your food safety and quality programs. It's interesting to note uh, that technology is being used today to, to help transform the programs that you already have in place. So really, technology becomes more of an enabler versus kind of a new project. Uh, what's unique about Safety Chain is the ability for you to deploy a variety of modules that you see here on the page that you can use to automate different elements of your food safety and quality programs. Uh, it begins, or, or it can begin, with your supplier compliance programs. This includes uh, portals through which you can collaborate with suppliers on documents and data, certificates of analysis, receiving inspection programs to ensure that your safety and quality programs are being implemented and delivered upstream with your, uh, with your suppliers. It includes uh, modules whereby you can automate your food safety programs. So if you think about your, your GMP and PRP programs that roll up into your HACCP, CCP checks. So this means that it's not only uh, document management, it's also data management, uh, automated forms to ensure that the tasks that have to be completed for your food safety programs are indeed being completed with closed loop corrective actions tracking. Um, there are also modules around food quality and management that ensures that you can have uh, automated specifications uh, management with in-process and finished product uh, specifications being uh, verified in real time, including trending, real-time trending charts, statistical process control. Uh, the fourth module allows you to automate much of your regulatory and GFSI management. This means that you can have uh, audit readiness for both USDA and, and FDA, FISMA compliance, as well as pre-built libraries around GFSI uh, audit readiness. Underscoring all of this are Safety Chain's mobile apps. What's uh, powerful about the Safety Chain technology is the ability to unplug from your desktop and to take technology with you through mobile apps out into the field, uh, to the far corners of your processing facilities, and even uh, on the road, if you were to go do an audit of your suppliers, Safety Chain can be delivered through very robust mobile apps. Uh, what's great about Safety Chain and the relationship with SQF is that the technology can help streamline how you manage your SQF programs through automated document and record management for your HACCP and preventative controls and SOPs. Uh, all of your programs are dynamically and automatically interlinked to the core library of your SQF codes with the ability to have uh, then supported desktop audits with auto notifications of documents that need to be reviewed uh, or, or other programs that are tied to your SQF uh, code. This means that everything can be centralized in a way so that you have audit readiness at the click of a mouse. So instead of spending weeks uh, getting ready to pull together all the paperwork and the records and the documents, everything is organized automatically through a technology program to ensure that you're continuously audit ready for your SQF, for your SQF programs. So that's a brief introduction to Safety Chain. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, we encourage you to go to our website uh, and to reach out and give us a call to learn more. Uh, but let's turn to today's event. Uh, I'm very proud to introduce Dr. John Barke. Uh, John is a senior scientist with Echolab, who is a global leader in, of course, we know water hygiene and energy technologies. John has a PhD in urban entomology and leads Echo Lab's pest elimination product development. Uh, John is an expert on pest elimination techniques in the food and beverage, healthcare, and hospitality industries. John has a master's and doctorate degrees from Purdue University. Go Boilermakers if you're a Boilermaker fan. John has published many articles on pest elimination and is the co-holder of several patents in this area. So we're quite proud to have John speaking with us today. 
And I'm also quite excited because, John, now I know who to call the next time my wife complains about getting ants in our kitchen. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to you, and we thank you for your participation today. Well, thank you very much, Barry, and thank you, Leslie, for uh, inviting me to speak to everyone today. And I'm very happy to be here and happy to see that we've got a lot of participants that are interested in this subject. Uh, it's important to know about integrated pest management and the importance of pests with regards to food safety and audit readiness for facilities. So that's the basis of what we're going to be talking about today. And um, I want to just start out by talking about the agenda. Of course, nothing more delicious over lunchtime than to talk about cockroaches, rats, and mice, and flies. But uh, we, uh, we'll try not to be uh, too graphic about it, but I do have a lot of uh, things to tell you in terms of the importance of food safety and why these particular pests are important to understand from an audit perspective and uh, doing the best we can to keep the facilities free of these pests. So why your pest program matters, why it's important to have a good pest elimination program with a food and beverage processing facility. And then we'll get into the, uh, the, some of the basics about filth flies, cockroaches, and rodents as some of the most important pests of the food industry. I won't get into stored product pests today. If anybody has any questions on stored product pests, that could be an entire webinar in itself because of its complexity. So these will be the ones that we focus on for today. And then, of course, we'll, we'll need to get into the hazard based IP, IPM. Uh, being audit ready and what is the responsibility of your pest provider as well as the facility management. And then there will be time for questions and answers. All right, so why your pest program matters. These are the top 21 CFR GMP observations and this is uh, from fiscal year 2010 and just shows uh, what are the top citations that we typically see. Failure to take effective measures to exclude pests uh, from processing areas. Uh, and this was uh, cited 504 times. Failure to provide adequate screening or other protection from pests, 310 times. Failure to properly store equipment, remove litter, cut weeds or grass that may harbor pests. So we're going to talk about conducive conditions as well. Uh, failure to maintain building fixtures, other physical facilities and sanitation conditions. And, and then of course what's really important is the washing of hands. Employees failing to wash and sanitize hands is, is one of the most common citations that we see. So. These are the top ones, and you can see that pests fall into that as a very important category. And from your brand protection standpoint, uh, this is a stock chart from one company with several major recalls versus the impact of 9-11, and you can see that it does uh, have a significant impact on a company's stock when there are recalls. And uh, definitely from the standpoint of uh, what the value of a pest elimination program it's really, you can see from the standpoint of cost for having a good pest provider providing regular service to prevent and eliminate any pests uh, can really, can really uh, save on the, on, the, on the possibility of food recall risk. So there's, there's millions in fines, uh, insurance deductibles, personal, personal injury. The average payout, this is an interesting statistic, the average payout for a major foodborne illness as measured by reviewing 12 outbreaks uh, and this was uh, from 1996 to 2009, the average was $45.8 million. So very expensive in terms of recalls, and pests can be an important part of that. So very important that you have a good pest management program in place, or if you're an auditor, you understand what it is that uh, you need to be looking for. So now we'll start with the delicious subject of filth flies. And we call them this because they are health pests, uh, they're known to carry a variety of pathogens and such like that. So uh, we're dealing with a few different species, and this is, this is uh, basically what we're going to be covering, biology and behavior. Why are they present in the facility? What are the food safety considerations? And then what can we do about them? So, uh, you know, there's many species of large fly, but the most important ones are the blow, the bottle flies. Uh, these are metallic in color. Uh, along with the common house fly and flesh flies. These are the most important in terms of what can come in based on a, a poor sanitation issue or conducive conditions. Uh, they do all breed uh, in filthy environments. The bottle flies uh, typically are, are decaying organic matter, uh, dead animals and feces, so these, all, all these flies can be associated with, with similar. Uh, flesh flies are pretty much strictly associated with carrion, uh, rotting meat. So somewhere something died 
It could be a rat inside of a wall, or it could be an animal outside, of course. These look like large house flies, uh, dark colored with three dark stripes on the thorax, which is just behind the eyes. Uh, they lay larvae on the carrion, scraps of meat. And you can see the life cycle of these flies is very fast, and each species lays about 500 eggs in their lifetime. So uh, there can be a very fast breeding uh, of these flies if the con if conditions are right. And then the most common fly that we deal with in the food industry is the house fly, the common house fly. Uh, these are very uh, acclimated to the human habitat. Uh, they've been with us for many, many years as we've been raising livestock for thousands of years, and they're very adapted to the farm, breeding prim primarily in manure. So if you can think about that, they're very important carriers of E. coli and very capable of dropping things off. So uh, this is, they're considered to be mechanical vectors of pathogens. And uh, in terms of the food safety impact, they're known to carry a variety of pathogens uh, and those that are known to cause foodborne illness. So filth flies generally breed outdoors. They're not usually breeding inside unless something terrible is going on, although it, it can happen. And flies present uh, may present you know, health concerns, as we talked about. They're detrimental to food safety. They spend most of the time resting, and most of this time is above two meters. So if you're wondering why some of your uh, fly lights by pest companies are placed at that height, uh, it's not only to keep them out of traffic, it is because that's where flies tend to rest and uh, more likely to go into the fly lights. We'll talk more about that later. And, uh, they, sp uh, and, and they, they can land on and walk around on ingredients, uh, packaging, processing equipment, and they drop off, uh, you know, whatever it is that they landed on before they will season on a new surface. So uh, they can carry and transmit known pathogens such as salmonella, uh, E. coli, and staphylococcus, and there's many other pathogens that have been associated uh, with large flies. So mechanical carriers of disease, that means that they're carrying these uh, pathogens on the outside of their bodies, and that's typically the mouth parts. Uh, and house flies in particular have a reflex when they land, they taste every surface. So uh, obviously they can drop things off uh, from, from that standpoint. So we'll get into some of the gory details here. And let's start with that mouth. That mouth part is called a proboscis and uh, it's a, again, a, typically a reflex when they land on a surface. And house flies, silk flies, cannot digest solid food. They have to regurgitate first to dissolve the food, and then they lap it up. So uh, again, I'm sorry if you're enjoying lunch right now, but uh, I want to take a look at the head of the fly here. Now, this is a scanning electron microscope picture that we took at our uh, research and development center. And we are going to focus on this part of the fly. This is the mouth part. And we're going to go into higher magnification. And what we're seeing here now is the end of the tongue, and you can see it's got a lot of grooves in it. Uh, the proboscis is, again, used for so sop sopping up liquids. And now we're up to about uh, 2,500 times magnification, and we can start to see some soil and such inside these grooves. And then we'll move in a little closer. Now we're at 7,500 times magnification. And here you can see bacteria clearly lodged in the fly mouth parts. Now, we don't know what species it is. You can't tell what species they are, of course, by looking at them. Uh, but we knew they were E. coli because we had, had the fly land on a uh, E. coli transmitted surface. This is a picture of the same mouth parts uh, from the American Journal of Tropical Medicine from an actual wild fly. And this is a fly taken from a farm area. And what did we say they breed in? They breed in manure. And so these are indeed E. coli. So. Uh, Manure is 70% bacteria, so I bet you didn't want to know that. But um, this is what they pick up as they move. So again, very important in terms of being able to transfer. Also, when we look at the tarsi, or the feet of the fly, uh, this is basically what it looks like at scanning electron microscope. I'll give you another angle here. So the tarsal claws, these are what are used to grab onto um, uh, rough surfaces, and then we have the pulvilli, which have uh, little suction cups so that they can land on smooth surfaces. The tenet sita uh, will allow it to, basically they can land on any surface. They're perfectly happy being upside down on the ceiling, and uh, obviously very capable of picking things up and moving them around physically. So that's the very important facts about house flies. 
And when, when we're inspecting and when you are inspecting, if you are an auditor or uh, somebody in QA uh, or even a pest provider, uh, you're going to be looking for signs of flies, not just the flies themselves, but they can drop off when they taste as well as from their feces, a uh, little spotting, uh, uh, which we can see uh, on surfaces. So that's what we look for when we go in and do inspections. Uh, if we see a lot of buildup, we know there's a lot of flies within that area. So in terms of developing a, a program around flies and such like that, uh, there's more than one step. There is no silver bullet. Uh, I'll get into some, uh, uh, some solutions for that, but it's important to understand that um, there's many, many approaches. I'm going to focus on, uh, because there are chemical treatments that can be done. Uh, generally, these are not done in production areas for obvious reasons but there can be chemical treatments that are done on fly resting surfaces to help knock them down. These would be primarily done outdoors with very restricted areas indoors. And then there are, of course, the use of fly lights. And I wanna spend some time talking about the use of fly lights because that, that's a, a program that most food plants will have in place, not just for uh, filth flies, but other flying insects. Uh, there's a variety of flying insects that can get in and uh, as well as stored product pests. So, these are just some basics on fly lights, and just to give you information, if you're looking for how they're placed and why they're placed where they are, and maybe they shouldn't be, uh, you're aware of what, what, what can be done. So principles of operation, we've got, uh, there's all kinds of models that are out there, wall-mounted, ceiling-hung, and portable units, and they've got different reasons uh, that they're used for, for different types of pests and different situations. Um, there are traps that do use electrocution. These should not be installed within the facility other than next to a dock door or by the outside where there's no possibility of contamination of food product as these do zap the flies and cause uh, insect debris to be uh, uh, scattered. So these should by no means be put in a, a processing area or an area near that. Uh, most common are the, the, the fly lights that use adhesives and the insects are captured on a tacky surface and they uh, remain there until disposal, so these would be serviced on a regular basis or replaced depending on the level of activity, and there's very little risk of scattering insect debris, so these can be used as a, a line of defense in a production area. And then there's stunning. Uh, not too many uh, uh, facilities have these, but they are available where they will stun the fly and put them into a glue board, uh, little risk of scattering insect debris because they're not being electrocuted. So that is the basics of capture and how we're trapping them and containing them. Now there's different types of bulbs and you're gonna need them different spectrums depending on what type of pest you're going after. Uh, unfiltered black light bulbs, um, uh, these are light blue in appearance. Uh, they're, they're the most common and really work the best on, uh, on attracting uh, fill flies. And the reason they see the spectrum the best uh, and it, it simulates actual sunlight the best. So this is one of the most common bulbs that's used indoors. There are filtered black light blue bulbs, and that is a dark blue emission. Uh, if anybody uh, here grew up in the 60s and the 70s, remember our black light posters, those are the types of bulbs that are used uh, in those uh, particular devices. And these tend to be more attractive to stored product pests. We say lepidopteran, those are moths and butterflies, but butterflies aren't pests. The moths, many species of moths can be and then coleopteran or beetle type uh, insects. So uh, some fly lights will have both for, for attracting both insects. And then there's a black light green and that emits both visible and UV light. Uh, and uh, it really depends on the species. In different parts of the world, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they've got different species of flies that are more attracted to these. But typically we're using the uh, unfiltered black light bulb in most of these units, okay? And lamp replacement, there's always questions about how often should we uh, replace uh, the bulbs. Generally, it's, the general rule is about a year after usage. Some companies use uh, meters, and there's a fine art to using meters to see if they're catching, because typically even the meter says that the UV is, de is decreased, you're still catching flies. So a general good rule is one year use of use of uh, when it's used. So if it's a six month program, you'd replace them every two years. Uh, and, uh, and so that's just a general rule. The optimum uh, operating temperature is 77, 77 degrees. So if it's warmer within the facility, they might, uh, they might burn out more quickly. 
And uh, the lamp's attraction also affected by the total area of the light emitting surface. So if you've got a reflective type of light trap, uh, that leaves a footprint on the wall that's generally larger than a beacon uh, that puts it out from the front. So that tends to attract uh, more flies in that type of setting. And then there are safety coated bulbs. These would be required in production areas, obviously. This reduces the risk of possible contamination in food plants and uh, decreased UV emission because of the coating, and that's about 15%, but as it says, it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, in terms of designing, uh, we typically have three phases. Uh, uh, architecture and engineering prints are very helpful. These are not just for the lights, but also for any rodent control devices that would be placed outside and within the facility. Uh, these would be referenced for QA uh, and the pest management providers and maintenance programs. So locate the uh, insect light traps for scheduling service and any uh, required uh, maintenance. So we're going to have a diagram and basically get into the different phases. Phase one is where we have the light traps placed around the perimeter of the facility. So this is the immediate exterior access points. So that, of course these are going to be the doors and this includes lobbies, loading ducts, tanker bays and places like that. And you can see we're placing them rather evenly in a grid-like pattern. That's important to be able to track insect activity and actually develop schematics of high-risk areas and where we are tracking that activity. Here's an example of one of those lights. This is an electrocution device that we talked about, and you can see that it is using both the uh, filtered and unfiltered uh, light bulbs so, uh, for the purpose of attracting a variety of species. So this is commonly done. Again, very careful not to put these anywhere else in the facility or closer to the facility because it does uh, there are scattered insect parts uh, when, the, when the flies are zapped. And then phase two is where we start going uh, into uh, more interior areas, the corridors, personal hallways, and you can see again, we're putting these out in a grid-like pattern, even-like pattern, to be able to do spatial analysis on uh, insect activity if that is what is going on. And uh, these tend to be large to mid-sized wall-mounted models and they're placed along the flight paths. Remember, that's got to be about two meters above, out of traffic, and uh, make sure that the, uh, there's plenty of room, if it's a reflective design, that there's at least a two-foot uh, area above the trap for the light to be emitted on. Otherwise, you're gonna, the catch is going to be reduced. And then phase three is basically going in critical areas. So these are where we're going to have exposed food product, processes-related materials, uh, and this is the final level of protection. So they can be used as monitors, and uh, we do use them as monitors. Threshold levels can be set for various pests, depending on uh, what the pest is, the experience of the particular facility, and the recommendations based on communication between the pest management provider and the, the QA, uh, the key contacts within the facility. So based on history and experience is where we, we set our, uh, our, our thresholds. Traps should be scatter-free in design, and when used as monitors, should be placed regularly and evenly. And again, this is so that we can uh, look at spatial analysis of insects uh, trapped within these facilities. So here it is all summarized. You've got phase one, two, and three illustrated. Uh, there's a lot of units in these facilities, but there's going to be um, uh, food plants are typically very large environments and will require many units uh, for protection. So other things around flying insect control, uh, of course, survey and inspecting, you want to look for conducive conditions, uh, trash collecting and staging areas, dumpsters, compactors are very attractive to flies. You want to have them as far away from the building exterior as possible. Uh, palleted stacks, uh, uh, wooden pallets are particularly a problem as they are attractive to a variety of pests, including birds, uh, and cockroaches, depending on where you are in the uh, United States, for, uh, the paradomestic species can get in there. Uh, and so make sure that uh, all of these things are taken care of and as well as looking for standing water, um, some food processing plants have effluent ponds and these ponds can be very attractive to a variety of pests, midges, mosquitoes, as well as other flying insects. So they can be managed uh, possibly with uh, certain treatments, but to minimize the amount of standing water and spillage and such is critical to keeping these pests at bay. Additional considerations, exclusion strategies are really more effective against uh, rodents, but there are things that we can do in terms of positive air pressure. 
Uh, there's air doors that can be installed above docks that produce a, a wind curtain that prevents the flies from coming in. They must be installed properly. The angle of the uh, air, air movement is important. Lighting, wherever possible, use the sodium vapor or the yellow type lights. Don't use the uh, uh, mer mercury vapor or halide type bulbs that will put out the very bright white light that has UV in it because that'll attract uh, flying insects from long distances. Uh, window tinting when possible. And then uh, exterior structure color, limit the white and yellow colors because these are attracted to uh, insects. And then grounds, as we've talked about, minimize those insect-friendly habits. Keep a good margin of concrete or, or gravel and such between the building and any foliage. Don't let any foliage touch the building and uh, make sure that perimeter is kept clean for inspection purposes as well as uh, rodent service. So there are helpful tools that we have and can make available to you. Uh, we've got a white paper on flies that talks about what I've talked covered as well as many other materials and fact sheets about flies as they are important uh, to your facility. Okay. So take note of any questions you have on flies. I'll, I'll be answering those uh, shortly here, but I'm going to move on to rodents. And rodents, uh, you know, will we'll basically cover the same common things that we did with the flies. Uh, what are the species, the habits, uh, signs of rodent activity, and then prevention and control. These are, these are the basics of what we'll cover today. Uh, we're dealing in, the, in North America with four uh, major species here. The house mouse is by far the most common. Uh, we have also a Norway rat and roof rat. And then in certain parts of the U U.S. we have deer mice. And deer mice are uh, important carriers of certain diseases, not so much the foodborne illness, but things such as uh, antivirus and things like that. But a variety of pathogens can be carried and vectored by these pests. Uh, most important are going to be the house mouse, Norway rat, and roof rat. Uh, I'm not going to get into the basic differences other than rats are big, mice are small, and then there are some behavioral differences to take, a, to take into consideration. And they do consume a vast amount of food. Millions of pounds of our food supply is eaten or contaminated by rodents every year. Uh, you can have equipment that's damaged. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That a rodent sighting can damage your brand and reputation. Um, and, you know, from a social media standpoint, I think we've seen maybe not from a food and beverage uh, facility, but definitely restaurants and such have gotten in the, in the news because everybody has a smartphone and can send things out there very quickly. So important that we, uh, we really keep these pests at bay. And in terms of the food safety impact, both rats and mice instinctively gnaw on things. Uh, they have more PSI in their jaws than Tyrannosaurus rex, so they can gnaw through anything except steel and concrete. So metal and concrete are about the only things they can't get through. Uh, so this, this is damaging to property and can be dangerous. Uh, of course, if you've got wiring and such, they have been known to start fires. Uh, and then, of course, the droppings. We'll talk about droppings as a sign as well as sometimes their urine. And these can contaminate food and food preparation services and equipment. And, the, and the, again, the most consequential effect may be damage to a brand reputation. Uh, they can spread disease causing organisms. Again, the salmonella, they, they're known to carry fleas and ticks and mites, can also transmit disease. And uh, rats, uh, if threatened, uh, can bite. So lots of reasons that these are important to us. So in terms of the habits and behaviors, uh, uh, exclusion is really something that, that can help. Every door should have a door sweep on it. That's the primary entry point of rodents is going to be through and under doors. Uh, there's other ways they can get in through utilities, but most commonly it's going to be through doors. Please have good quality door sweeps on all uh, man doors uh, uh, leading into the facility, and then you're going to want to make sure you, there's some things that we can do in the dock area too to dis discourage entrance, but keep the doors closed as much as possible with good uh, barriers to keep them from coming in. Mice can enter an opening as little as a quarter inch, and this is an adult mouse. It can squeeze through. Uh, the limiting factor is the size of its skull. Rats just a little bigger, uh, half an inch entry. And it should be known that rats are very neophobic, so when new equipment is put out, new things are in their way, they will be shy of it. So there's an art to trapping and going after rats once they've gotten indoors. They're very intelligent. You cannot catch more than one rat in a trap. That's why there aren't any multiple rat traps, because if they sense a friend in trouble, they won't go in there. You know, they, don't, they don't help each other out, I guess. And then mice are very inquisitive. That's why there are multiple trap catch systems for mice. Uh, and uh, again, they can get through very small openings. And I just want to click through this to show you uh, in the upper right here, we have a, uh, 
a demonstration, a little mouse here that's going to sneak through a, a crack here for us. So uh, just to demonstrate their ability, that's a very small crack and no problem getting through that at all. So really, exclusion is important. Find out how they're getting in and do the best to deter them from doing that. In terms of the signs of rodent activity, we're looking for their droppings and uh, no real good way to tell if they're fresh. Okay, so uh, if, they're, if they are absolutely fresh, they'll be a little soft and such, but once they've dried out, there's no way to tell what the age of them are. Uh, rat droppings do look different than rodent droppings. Of course, they're larger and um, they uh, are not necessarily a sign of an active infestation. So when they are found, they should be cleaned up. Uh, if you're, if you're going to vacuum them up, you want to use a HEPA filter. I don't recommend vacuuming. I recommend more uh, using a sanitizing 5% uh, chlorine bleach solution or a, sim or a quad sanitizer and such and mopping uh, and wiping them up and uh, disposing of them. And keep track of uh, any activity seen so we can know if there's any fresh activity. There's also something called rub marks. And this comes from the oil uh, of, the, of the animal. Over time, it is deposited. Uh, so you can see the oil rub mark here on the side. And these are actually urine stains from house mice that will accumulate over time. So they know this is the place to be. It's an attractive area. It does have some uh, odor to it, uh, chemical communication, if you will, that they recognize. Here are swing marks. And these are done by rats on the rafters here. You can see that they've, they swung and again, leaving their uh, oil marks on the uh, side here. And then we've got trails and tracks, uh, and these can be in dusty areas, mills, uh, and bakeries and such. So this is, these are all signs of activity that, that you should be looking for. Uh, urine does fluoresce. Mice urine uh, will fluoresce, and there's black lights and such that can be used to detect them. But it should be understood that there's many things that fluoresce. So just, be, just because you find a fluorescent spot doesn't mean that it is... Uh, it is rodent urine, but uh, it can be looked for in this manner. Oops, skipped one. Let me move back here. Okay, so in terms of the uh, sanitation and such like that that we're looking at, um, you want to make sure all employees are educated to keep the doors and windows closed at all times. Um, the points of sanitation should be put in the uh, uh, sanitation and structural report. And you're going to have a partnership with the pest management provider in the facility and certain actions will need to be taken uh, in the exclusion and prevention uh, of these, these uh, uh, animals. So um, make sure that all of these are, are, are in place. Uh, rodents uh, are very common in rural areas, so if the food and beverage facility is located uh, near a farming community, uh, the rats and the mice are going to be particularly troublesome. One note is we are seeing the roof rat more commonly on the interstates now. We never used to see them in Arizona. Now we are seeing air, uh, uh, roof rats very commonly in Arizona. It used to be just a coastal uh, animal, but now it has moved in. And it is the most challenging of the rodent species, not just because of its intelligence, but it is a 3D pest. It will get up into the upper portions of the building, so it can be particularly challenging. So when we're dealing with roof rats, there's lots of places we need to be looking for them. So. This is just a summary of conducive conditions and things that need to be taken care of that we've covered. Again, make sure that pallet management is, uh, you're, you're getting first in, first out. Uh, watch that standing water. And then make sure we've got door sweeps on every door because you can see here, this is a point where a rodent actually burrowed in under, uh, under a door. So these are all interception points that should be, uh, should be in place. And then uh, on the exterior, there's a variety of stations that are available. They can be used to harbor uh, toxic or non-toxic bait for monitoring. Multiple trap catch systems for mice can be put in these. Uh, on the interior, uh, it's typically trapping. We're not using bait indoors because we don't want that bait translocated by the rodent and the possibility of contamination there. So we have multiple trap catch systems also put in. Repeaters, tin cats, as, uh, brand names that are used. And then snap traps are really best for harvesting large populations, and this would be particularly true for rodents, or, or excuse me, rats. Rats, uh, uh, there's, there's technique to going after them. It's, it's a fine art, especially if they become well established in a facility. Usually when we're trapping uh, rodents out, the very first ones that we catch are the very young and the dumb. And then what's left are the intelligence. They tend to be alpha males or females. And they're very smart, uh, dominant in the uh, rodent population, and they, 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 they recognize people's habits, and they learn to avoid human activity. So that's where they become very challenging, and uh, just putting traps out overnight will not necessarily solve the problem. It can take 
uh, it can take a week or two to eliminate an entire infestation in some situations. So again, we've got educational material. Uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so you can go back and listen to it and uh, making sure that you're up to speed on the pests that we're talking about. Okay, so let's move on to cockroaches, my favorite pest. It's what I got my master's and PhD studying, believe it or not. Um, and uh, we've got the common cockroaches. Uh, domestic species are the German and the brown banded. These cockroaches absolutely have to have people to survive. You will not find them outside of the human habitat. And the German cockroach is the number one. Uh, it is the one that we find in the food industry. Brown banded tends to be more of a residential pest, and we don't find it as commonly in food service or in food and beverage facilities. The paradomestic species, that means that they're coming in from the outside. Uh, they take advantage of our habitat, but they don't need us to survive. And these include what they oftentimes call palmetto bugs down in the south. They call them that so they don't scare away the tourists. But these are cockroaches. And the American cockroach is the most common uh, next to the oriental in the U.S. Uh, but when we start getting into Europe and other places, the oriental cockroach is uh, very common. Then we've got other species that are related, like the Australian brown, smoky brown, and others all very similar in biology habits, coming from the outside, usually don't infest inside unless there's conducive conditions to help them survive, uh, but they can come in in large numbers, especially after a rain uh, or if there's uh, pressure for whatever reason coming in from the outside. So these are the common species that we deal with. And they are also known to be mechanical carriers of pathogens. So the same idea here is they're feeding and such. Um, now, this is a Petri dish, uh, another demonstration. Uh, we, ha we exposed a German cockroach to an E. coli uh, contaminated surface, and that was a, a head of lettuce. And then as it walks around the Petri dish, every little footprint there is producing a colony. So just as with the house fly, uh, very capable of picking things up and transferring them, and they've been associated uh, scientifically with foodborne pathogens listed there, as well as many other pathogens. So important to keep the German cockroach out of your facilities. Signs of cockroach activity, obviously live, uh, live activity. We also look for the fecal matter, and it looks like pepper. And you can see here we have cockroaches as well as the fecal matter uh, deposited. And uh, cracks and crevices, these are thigmatactic insects. They like to be up against in, uh, edges. They're not comfortable being out in the open. They're not comfortable being out in the light. So if you see them out in those areas, it means there's probably many, many more hiding somewhere. And then the root causes of cockroach activity, uh, incoming shipments. Uh, and again, there's that reused crates and pallets. German cockroach loves cardboard. So whatever you can do to break down that cardboard, get it compacted and, and removed from the facility, uh, once it's used, uh, please do that. And then they can come in with staff and visitors. A locker room is oftentimes a source because uh, uh, employees uh, may be in an apartment uh, come from an apartment complex that has a German cockroach infestation, and uh, cockroaches are good hitchhikers, so they can get into backpacks, purses, things like that, and then be brought in. Each uh, A gravid female has uh, 36 to 48 eggs within the egg capsule, so very fast reproduction uh, in the German cockroach. In fact, it is the fastest reproducing uh, species that we deal with. Uh, now, prevention and control, um, of course, correcting structural deficiencies and make sure, you know, if you're getting recommendations from your pest provider uh, that they are actually conducive to the cockroach because there's going to be food. There's going to be spilled food. doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, or product uh, that you're making, doesn't necessarily mean that it's conducive if it's being cleaned up on a regular basis. Um, and then any structural deficiencies, do the best you can to keep uh, gaps and places like that that cockroaches can hide in. Well sealed with industrial materials. Uh, don't use just latex caulk. Uh, use uh, industrial materials that will last for a period of time in the food, uh, food processing environment. And then employee awareness. Keep your employees educated on what to look for. And then we'll get into the insect uh, pest management for German cockroaches. So those are the major pests. And what I want to cover now uh, at, at the end of the pre presentation is the very exciting subject of HACCP-based IPM. And I say it's exciting because I'm sorry I don't have any good pictures to show you on this, but it is an important topic. And we want to talk about the roles and responsibility within the facility. And integrated pest management, um, it has uh, you know, a, a definition that's been put together by the National Pest Management Association. Originally, IPM started with agriculture. 
and it makes perfect sense. We're not using so much pesticide that we're eliminating all of the pests. On the farm, they use just enough pesticide to prevent damage from the pests. So a certain amount or threshold, if you will, is acceptable on the farm. It's a little different in the urban environment, especially when we talk about these pests, how many is acceptable. Uh, certainly you may not be able to keep every house fly out or every stored product pest out, but you do want to do the best you can to keep every rodent out, so the threshold there should be zero, and you're going to be monitoring those from activity on the outside as well as uh, any trapping next to uh, uh, introduction points, such as next to doors. So again, setting that threshold is done between the pest management provider and the key contact within the facility. So communication is important. And IPM is a decision-making process. So, you know, it has, uses non-chemical techniques first and foremost. So these include structural repair, maintenance, biological and mechanical control techniques, and lastly, pesticide application. And uh, so under the process, your IPM, uh, you know, in terms of the facility as well as the pest, pest provider, Thorough inspections on site, monitoring of pests, identifying the conditions that, are, that really contribute to the presence of those pests. And only then does the technician take reasonable and effective action. And this is called precision targeting to control them and prevent them from returning. So IPM is a combination of approaches that gets the job done. And it's not a non-pesticide approach. I wanna, I wanna place, that, uh, place that out there, but it is an approach that puts other prevention techniques first in an effort to reduce the amount of product applications or pesticide applications that need to be made. So under this uh, audit and regulatory environment, it is strongly recommended that an IPM plan is followed under today's, uh, under today's guidelines. So in terms of being audit ready, uh, and the food and beverage and the pest elimination process. Uh, food and beverage plant survey identifies opportunities uh, to increase sanitation as best as possible. Build program based off needs and success is reduction of the bacteria and the cost savings associated with food recall and contamination and all that jazz. And then pest elimination, uh, of course there will be doing a regular plant surveys. Sometimes, some facilities will have a pest management provider on site every day due to their size. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, they're going to conduct a risk assessment. What are the true risks to pests? Not every, everything that's going on within the facility uh, may be conducive to pests, so that really needs to be done carefully so that people aren't wasting their time. Build scope of service based off of the needs. And the success is 100% uh, uh, audit scores, execution against the scope, and a pest-free environment. So this is the, what, it, what it takes for success. And then from the roles and responsibility uh, in the integrated pest management program, food and beverage. We need to have access uh, to uh, uh, you know, com communication with the pest service provider and um, it needs to be a good partnership. So a key contact is required for the service specialist who services the facility. Uh, the pest provider will need access to parts of the facility uh, that are conducive, so that these would be locked areas, uh, possibly the roof. The roof is a very common place that we need to be inspecting, and uh, this is gonna be necessary for them to be able to fulfill their service. So fix the conditions that the pest service provider identifies, and these conditions should be documented clearly by the pest provider when they perform these services. And uh, they should also perform regular program reviews and make recommendations on the program changes in order to address any change in the risk profile of your facility over time. So this is gonna change in terms of what's going on over the year and years of uh, production. In terms of uh, moving on to hazard-based IPM, this is what we're gonna cover. And it's much what uh, you would do for uh, HACCP, uh, but this time you're focusing on pest critical control points. And uh, look, at, look at it from that perspective. So you're following the same process that you normally would for HACCP uh, within your facility, but in this case, uh, we're following these steps. So you're conducting a hazard analysis, um, and this is gonna be, again, using that facility diagram, the grounds, the building, the interior areas and the rooms and draw flow of products into the facility through production, shipping, garbage, and, and reclamation, and then conduct a thorough survey of the plants surrounding grounds using that flow diagram. So you're gonna mark those conditions. Uh, you're going to um, 
Mark locations where crawling or flying pests may gain access into the areas, in structures or sensitive areas. And then mark locations where ingredients and or products are exposed and where pests may be able to contact or become introduced. Make sure all possible pest-related hazards are marked on the flow diagram. And then we're identifying those pest critical control points. So location or area in a plant that can be applied uh, at a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, where, where pest control can be applied and a pest-related food hazard has been prevented, eliminated, or reduced to an acceptable level. Again, that acceptable level needs to be a decision process uh, based on experience uh, and as well as the science. Establish pest monitoring procedures, observations or measurements to assess whether the pest critical control point is under control and produce an accurate record for future use and verification. And then you're going to establish the corrective actions and uh, when the pest activity has passed the critical limit or the threshold value, and that may include increasing service frequency, product application, and then, uh, of course, all of this needs to be a record keeping on the pest critical control point list. And then establish those record keeping procedures, document and survey the flow diagram kept in the service logbook. The current uh, list should be kept in the logbook and monitoring records to be kept within the pest service documentation. And then, of course, with HACCP, we've got verification procedures, right? So you're going to do the same thing uh, for the pest, validation, any tests if the critical limit process is working, verification, all required information is documented, and then we have to reassess. New hazards should be added and change in the process should be taken. So adjust that IPM plan accordingly. So again, we've got these identification guides to, uh, to help you uh, uh, look at these different pests. Um, and uh, we didn't cover up on stored product pests today, but that's because there's a lot of different types of stored products uh, that could be uh, warranted for a, uh, another session. But that's what I uh, basically had to, to cover for you today. And at this point, I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, John. Um, we did have several uh, technical questions come in as you were speaking, so what I did is I just copied them down and I messaged them to you in the chat section on the right-hand side. Um, let me know if, if, when you see them. Okay, I do see the questions. Do you want me to just run through them one by one, or how, do you, how would you like me to do that? Um, yeah, if you just want to start maybe like at the top. I've, I've been messaging them, uh, I think, quite a few over to you, so um, I guess you can just run through them in whatever order yeah. you feel. Okay. Um, yeah, let me, let me do the first one. How many feet, uh, and it's, it, it, it's paraphrased, but how many feet the pest trap shall be placed outside the building? Okay, this needs to be based on risk and with the new Food Safety Modernization Act and things that are coming down the pike with that, and uh, certainly SQF, it's risk-based. So AIB, if you were to follow AIB guidelines, they, they, they specify a certain interval. Uh, that really today isn't the best approach. It's the best uh, approach on the risk, where are the rodents coming in, what are the introduction points. There may be places that you don't want to put these because they may actually be attracting rodents to the facility. So that should be uh, done with the survey and determining you know, where the rodents, what, what's the activity, what's the history of the facility been to, uh, to allow that. Now, because of uh, certain rules that have been put out there, um, we did have EPA limit how far away from the facility we can put a rodent station. Uh, it used to be 50 feet, uh, or limited to 50, 50 feet, and uh, we were able to change that to 100 feet from a man-made structure. So if you have a man-made structure on your facility, you can place a rodent bait station or trapping station within 100 feet of that man-made structure. So if that's the question, uh, I hope that helps answer you there. Okay, uh, and somebody liked my comment about black light posters, so that's good. All right, so, um, and then a question on light bulbs. Do bulbs of electrocution need to be replaced as frequently as other light traps? I would say yes, um, uh, it, but they, it is gonna be a, a, a more filthy environment because of the nature of the, uh, the trap. It is, it is basically uh, causing exploding uh, fly parts and such. So they'll have to be cleaned more regularly and the balls can uh, include it. The balls should be dusted off. But I'd say the, the, the change frequency will be about the same for those balls on a, on a yearly uh, use pattern. Good question. Okay. Are stunning light traps acceptable in food handling areas? You know, uh, I believe they are. They've got less risk 
uh, then they, they do. But if it's a food processing area, um, make sure that the bulbs are shatterproof. Uh, that we, I showed a picture of those. Um, and um, my preference would be to have, since they're knocking them down into probably a glue board anyway, uh, just to have a reflective type, type trap. But they are effective in those areas, and I do believe that they can be used uh, unless the rules have changed. Next question, what are the guidelines for the distance a dock door plate? Okay, so we talked about the light traps, uh, the distance. As close as you can to intercept the flies as they're coming in the facility. If the dock door does not have a good air, uh, positive air pressure, or an air door, as it's called, with that which actually produces an air curtain that deters the flies, you're going to want to put that light trap as close as possible. You're not going to want to put them outside, of course, because that'll attract flying insects to the facility, and there may be some uh, dangers there when it comes to safety and electrocution. Uh, but place them as close as you can to the to that entrance. And then we have a light trap hanging on the wall perpendicular and about eight feet away from the dock door when installed uh, with an installed air curtain. That's fine. That's, that's perfect. Uh, and, uh, and then the, it, the, the sentence ended. Oh, here it goes. The auditor made a comment that the light trap actually attracted insects inside. It is possible. Don't have those bulbs facing towards the outside. Uh, you want them so that they're facing towards the inside so the fly sees them when they get in, but not uh, drawing flies into the building. Some insects are attracted to UV light from miles away. House flies aren't. Uh, you know, house flies is, is a distance of a matter of feet, but um, uh, other insects can see it from a lot, much farther distance. So great question. Don't have that light shining towards the outside. Uh, okay, question part two. Um, the light trap actually attracted insects inside. Should we move the light trap farther away? Yes, yes, absolutely. And also check the pattern of that air curtain. If it's not right, it can actually suck insects into the building. So make sure the, uh, the angle of that air curtain is, is pushing the insects outside. Another question, what are your thoughts on outside catch-all traps? Can, should they be uh, placed or on uh, blocks or not? So the catch-all traps, um, these are multiple trap catch systems, uh, and uh, they are similar to the tin cat in, in that uh, catch-alls, they're a wind-up. So a wind-up trap um, is uh, something that uh, requires maintenance, of course, and as the rodent enters, it triggers a, a, little, uh, a little trap that flips it into the uh, container in the trap. Uh, then you've got your tin cats um, and uh, repeaters, as they're called. These are also metallic in nature, and they have a teeter-totter mechanism. So when the mouse goes in, it, uh, it flips that teeter-totter and it can't get back out. And, uh, these are typically used indoors. They will corrode over time, and so I don't recommend putting these outside. Rather, we, there, there are plastic bait stations that are available that can have multiple trap catch systems installed within them. Ecolab has a proprietary unit that we use for mice on the outside catching them. We have certain customers that do not want us to use rodenticides. So yeah, a trapping system can be put out, but I recommend that they be, be put in a, a plastic uh, station to prevent that corrosion. More often, we're using the bait stations on the inside. <coughs> excuse me, and then um, uh, uh, bait stations on the outside, and then the traps are used on the inside. And then the question alludes to: Can they be put up on a block? Yes, they can. I've seen mice jump over the catch-alls and the and the repeaters when they're placed at floor level. They can also jump over them though, even when they're placed up on a block. But to secure them, which I think is what the question is getting to, because these should be secured next to entry areas, uh, there are methods for doing that. Um, there's metal containers that can be installed over them to hold them down. Forklifts oftentimes damage these units, um, so I think they, they, they purposely run into them sometimes. But uh, make sure that they, they do have guards on them if forklifts are an issue. Otherwise, you'll be replacing a lot of equipment. Outside, again, don't recommend them because they do tend to corrode uh, use the plastic stations outside. Okay, how do you ensure you, okay, uh, let's see, next question. How do you ensure you have the correct amount of fly lights in your facility? Again, this is a decision-making process and there's no standard for how many flies you need in there, or fly lights. Uh, you may be going after other pests. It may be uh, related to small flies within your facility, such as fruit flies, fungus gnats, uh, different types of stored product pests, um, midges, uh, all of these can be 
problems in different parts of the country or different uh, habitats, uh, not just the house flies and such. So you're going to have to monitor for which pests are coming in and where, and you're going to want to focus the, those, those areas where you have the most pest activity. That's why by starting out in a grid-like pattern, you can, through computer analysis, uh, take your catch, catches in each of the trap, plug them into this, there's different software that's out there, and it will spatially map where you have the most activity and where you should be focusing your, your search. But it's generally good to have them at least uh, at first in a grid-like pattern to establish where those critical control points are going to be. Great question. Okay. Any recommendation for communication between the contractor and the plant? How best to document exchange of information regarding inspection and service results, needed corrective actions, uh, et cetera. So there you're going to want to have a log book, and you're going to have to place it in an agreed upon area, uh, whether it be quality assurance uh, office, uh, the key contact, uh, sometimes that's engineering. And uh, you want to have the log book, you want to have all of the MSDSs for any types of products, sanitizers, pesticides, whatever may be used in there, the facility diagrams with uh, where all of your equipment is placed, and a record of all of the services. So all of this needs to be kept up because an auditor coming in will want to see all of that and to make sure that uh, pesticides are being legally applied and documented and uh, that uh, safety measures are in place and that corrective actions have been put in place and validated. So that's the best, best way I can tell you. You want to have a central location for this that's accessible to both the QA and the uh, pest service provider. And let's see, any more questions coming in? That's it. That's all I have. So unless anybody has any other questions, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. You had a really good presentation today. Um, one last thing. Do you have any contact information where maybe someone could reach you if they do think of something later or um, anything else on, on this topic? Do you have, like, an email address that they can reach you at? Yes, it's John, J-O-H-N, dot Barkay, B-A-R-C-A-Y, at Ecolab, E-C-O-L-A-B, Dot com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it looks like that wraps up today's Learning Lunch webinar. A big thanks to John with Ecolab for his wonderful presentation on pest management and food processing facilities. And also a huge thank you to, um, to, to Barry Maxim and Safety Chain for sponsoring today's event. In case you didn't hear me uh, say this at the very beginning of the presentation, we did record today's event. Uh, so the good news is that you guys can always go back and watch this later. It'll take me about a week to go through and process this recording and edit it, but it should be up under the events tab of sqfi.com in about a week to a week and a half. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will hopefully see you for the next Learning Lunch. Take care.